greetings to you from Germany. Um, maybe I should add uh, two more words. I have been quite often to Africa, to about 14 countries in Africa, and uh, also have been to Kenya for about three days, uh, more, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, my father was a missionary doctor in Tanzania. And so my aunt and a half brother are buried there. They died in, in, in Tanzania. That was prior to World War II. So a long time ago. Um, when Jeff asked me to talk about Islam, I was not quite sure what would be relevant to you. So I asked uh, Reverend Titus to give me those questions that he felt uh, would be helpful. And uh, he, he gave me a number of, of topics and I will just read the issues he mentioned so that you know what will come in these uh, three papers. How should we present the gospel to the Muslims? How should the church disciple Muslim converts to Christianity without imposing upon them cultural baggage? What is the worldview of Muslims? How should we connect with Muslims? What is the understanding of Muslims about the future life? Uh, that means eschatology. How should we encounter the challenge of Islam in Kenya? What are biblical values Muslims and Christians share? What is Islam? Who is a Muslim? What are the different sects of Islam in Kenya? And how should we intentionally evangelize them? Which are the misconceptions Christian might have about Muslims? How do Muslims perceive Christians? Why should the Christians in Kenya be concerned about the dominance of Muslims in leading positions in the government? So these are some of the issues that um, I have been asked to address. And as I mentioned, it will be in three different papers. And the first paper will deal with Islam as such. Then the second uh, paper will deal with the issue of evangelism. And also at the end, I will talk a little bit about uh, discipleship training of new converts. And in the last uh, paper, I will deal with the questions of concerns that uh, Christians might have in Kenya, in Germany, and in other, other places. So that's um, about what you can expect from me uh, this morning. And as um, Reverend Jeff uh, Yoon mentioned, just write down the questions you might have, and uh, I will try to address and to answer these questions at the end. Um, the question about who is a Muslim, of course, is um, not so easy. May I ask one question of you? Are there Muslim converts among yourselves? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the question of... No, no, none. None, okay, thank you. Um, the question, what is Islam and who is a Muslim, of course, is a very wide question because there is not just one form of Islam, um, but Islam and Muslims are as diverse as you will find it among Christians. There's not just one form of Christianity. Yes, there are basic issues which are the same, but uh, of course, there are different, different, many differences among um, 
uh, Christians, and the same you will find among Muslims, of course. If you look at Islam from a world perspective, Islam is the second most widespread of the world's religions, with now almost two billion adherents. So it's a, it's a big group of people. It's almost one fourth of the population of the world. And uh, as I live all over the world in so many different countries, so many different cultures, you can imagine how diverse uh, Muslims are. On the one side, you have <clears throat> Muslim diverse, uh, Muslim majority countries where Islam is determining what is going on in a country. And on the other hand, you have countries like Germany, like Kenya, where Muslims are a minority and they integrate sometimes better, sometimes not as good into the general situation of the country. Um, you have the organization of um, Islamic cooperation, an organization with 57 countries where Islam is in the majority. That just gives you a picture about the situation of Islam worldwide. At times, the Arab world has been considered the heartland of Islam, but the continents with the most Muslims are actually Asia and Africa. And the largest Muslim countries are Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Central Asia, Nigeria, Egypt, and Turkey. So that is a situation where, because the number of population in the Arab countries is not as big. The term Islam derives from an Arab word with three consonant S, L, and M. And if you see the three consonants S, L, M, it can either mean Islam or it can mean Salam. Islam means submission, Salam means peace. And at times it is being claimed that Islam uh, is a religion of peace, and we'll address that in the third paper. In order to become a Muslim, you either are born into a Muslim family or you convert to Islam, and then you, you have to say the, the shahada, the, the creed, and embrace Islam. If you look at the issue of content and beliefs, then Islam stands, of course, in a long line of religions that come out of the Middle East. What is Palestine today, uh, the Arab world, and you have Judaism, you have Christianity, and you have Islam, and there are other religions who came out from this area, and therefore it's not surprising that there are some um, similarities. And if you look into Judaism and into Christianity and Islam, you will find that um, Abraham or Ibrahim uh, is playing a big role in all three religions. But Judaism and Christianity um, refer back to the son Isaac of Abraham, and Islam is referring back to Ishmael. So there, 
among the sons of Abraham, then the division starts. And uh, so that brings all the differences then. A word to the Quran. <clears throat> Muslims believe that um, the Quran was revealed by God to Abraham, revealed by the angel Gabriel, word by word in the seventh century. And if you look into a Quran, I don't know whether you have ever read the Quran, 114 surahs. Some of these surahs have been received in Mecca while Muhammad lived in Mecca. Most of the surahs have been received in Medina when um, Muhammad with some of his followers moved from Mecca to Medina in the year 600 and 22. And if you look into a <clears throat> Quran, you would find at the beginning always the mentioning of that particular surah has been revealed in Mecca or in Medina. And there are differences, there are clear differences between the two types of uh, Islamic or Quranic surahs, because in Mecca, um, Muhammad was a warner. Quite soon, many people didn't like him. They put pressure on him. There was persecution of Muhammad. And therefore, he was very careful in what he said. And at one time in 615, he actually advised uh, about 80 of his followers to move to Africa, to Ethiopia, to escape from the persecution of the early Muslims in Mecca. And a few years later, then he moved to Medina. And there, Muhammad became not just a religious figure, a spiritual figure, but he became a statesman, a politician, a military leader, and he took part in about 27 military raids and wars. And so the tone of the surahs which he received in uh, Medina are quite different. They are more forceful, they are more separating himself from others, more aggressive, and uh, so the the difference between the two types of surah becomes quite uh, obvious. The center of um, Islam is the belief in one God. It's a, a very strict monotheism. And they call God, of course, Allah. If you look into the etymology of that word, Allah, it is actually a general term. It's not a name. It's the same as the Hebrew El or Elohim or the word God. It's not a name of a God. It's just the word God. And therefore, whether you speak of Allah or whether you speak of God doesn't make a big difference. The word Allah is also used by Christians, Arab-speaking Christians. It might be actually the same, I don't know, whether in Kiswahili uh, you say Allah or have a different word. I lived for 14 years in Indonesia and the normal word God in Indonesian is Allah. So even the Christians there pray to Allah. They might pronounce it a bit different, but so the word Allah is not a name of a God, but simply it means God. Um, if you compare the monotheism of Islam with the monotheism of Christianity, there is of course a big difference. The 
center of the understanding of monotheism in Islam is uh, the unity, the Tawheed, that's the Arab word for it, and the sovereignty of God. And that doctrine uh, dominates basically all the beliefs of Muslims. And it's quite important to understand because this strict monotheism is, is different to what we believe in the Bible. I read a few sentences from one of the um, important theologians, Islamic theologians, Muhammad Abduh, a former uh, president of the Islamic Al-Azhar University in Cairo and former Grand Mufti of Egypt. And he defined uh, Tawheed as follows. The, that's a quote. The theology of unity or Tawheed studies the being and attributes of God. The original meaning of Tawheed is the belief that God is one and there's nothing else beside him in divinity, one in divinity, inalienable divinity. And from him alone, all being derives and in him alone, every purpose comes to its term. Therefore, the Islamic religion is a, a religion of unity throughout. It's not a religion of conflicting principles. That's what um, Muhammad Abdul says, but is built squarely on reason while divine revelation is its pillar. As God is one, his rule and will or law are comprehensive, extending to all creatures and in all aspects of life. So in Islamic belief, God controls not only history, but all our lives and our steps, our wills, and is interfering into human life. So that's uh, important to understand uh, why uh, Muslims behave at times the way they do. And so Tawheed plays a very big term. And just on the sideline, that makes it so difficult for Muslims if we as Christians share about our Christian faith and speak of Jesus as the son of God. If you do that in, in Arab countries, it might happen that, that Muslims raise their hand and, and take a distance as if you would blaspheme because to them to put any, anything at the side of Allah uh, is shirk and that is the biggest sin someone can do. And therefore it is quite interesting when you talk to Muslim you have to be aware of certain reactions that might come uh, if they are really believing Muslims. Um, just to illustrate that issue, how important the issue of Tawheed, of the unity and that very strict monotheism that almost is a monism um, in Islamic theology, in the 8th and 9th century, they talked about the issue whether the Quran, the scriptures of Islam, whether that had been created. They believe there is a copy of the Quran in heaven, the mother of all Korans, whether that is a creation of God or whether it always has been as God as always has been, uncreated. And uh, at one time in uh, Islamic theology, there have been fights about that issue. Today, most Muslims would say the Quran is uncreated, but was revealed to Muhammad while he was uh, in Mecca and Medina. 
if you look to um, Islamic beliefs and practice, it's both important uh, in Islamic uh, belief. Yes, they have to believe at particular issues. It's about Allah, it's about the messengers, the prophets, it's about scriptures, it's about the angels, and particularly it's also about uh, the destiny of people and it's about the last day and the last day uh, and the end times and eschatology plays a very big role in Islamic theology and we'll come to that uh, more at the end. The five pillars of um, Islam, as you probably know, is one it's a shahada, the, the, the greed. Um, the second is a prayer. Muslims, if they are really pious Muslims, would go five times a day to the mosque or do, do prayers at home. It's a ritualistic um, prayer. We have to perform it in a particular way. It starts with the intention. Then you have the washings. And then you have a particular ritual um, with certain words, certain movements that you have to do five times a, a day. So that is uh, the creed and, and um, the, the prayer. The third pillar is a charity. Muslims have to give zakat. And that is in many countries, it's about 2.5% of their earnings. Then the uh, fourth pillar is the fasting in the, mo in the month of Ramadan, Psalm, and the last pillar is the pilgrimage to Mecca at least, at least once in a lifetime, if you are able to afford it. And some Muslims would have a sixth pillar and they talk about jihad, the struggle for God, that does not always mean military struggle, but also mean a struggle uh, to achieve purity in the struggle to be a pious Muslim and so on. But I will talk about jihad in the third paper. If you look um, at Islam worldwide at the moment, you will notice that for the last oh, you can say in the last 100 years, Islam has been in a process of renewal, reformation, revivalism, um, which means different things to different people. And it's certainly different to what we mean in Christianity when we talk about revival or renewal. But um, you simply have to, to realize that Muslim has a very big emphasis on tradition and very much depends on what happened in the seventh century. And now Islam is in the process to adjust to the modern age. And for that reason, there have been big discussions um, on this issue of uh, revivalism, of reformation, of renewal in the last hundred years. Um, if you look to Islam, then uh, of course you have different types. You have the traditional Muslim, you have modern Muslims, you have in the West, particularly more and more Muslims who leave Islam because they dislike the violence and what is going on in Iran. We have a lot of refugees from uh, Iran who, who, who hate Islam because of what is happening in Iran. So uh, not every Muslim is the same. You have to, to, to meet an individual person. You have to inquire about what he believes in order to assess where he stands. The next issue I want to talk about uh, is Sharia law. Most Muslims, particularly adherents of political Islam, 
so-called Islamists consider the Sharia to be both the basis of belief and Islamic behavior and also an indispensable order for an Islamic society. Um, because it plays such an important role in, in laws, in how most, uh, Muslim countries um, order their countries, uh, I want to talk about uh, the issue in order that it becomes clearer. Because when we hear about ho or, uh, law, we think of books of law and everything is written down and you can look up what the law says. That is not the case with um, Sharia law. Sharia, uh, the Muslims have two terms, two Arabic terms for law. One is Sharia and the other is Fiqh. And uh, Sharia is God's law based on the Quran and on the tradition, the Sunnah. And in short, the tradition is basically a, a collection of what Muhammad has said and what he behaved, what he did, his habits. And these are collected in collections of uh, the so-called Hadith or Sunnah. And I will talk about that in a moment. Um, so if let's say a Muslim comes to um, a law expert with a particular question, whether he would be allowed in Islam to do this or that, then the expert would look into the Quran, would look into um, the tradition, whether he would find anything that Muhammad said or did with regard to the question. He would look up what early Muslim legal experts in the 8th and 9th century said or wrote about uh, this issue. And if it doesn't find anything, neither in the Quran, nor in the tradition, nor in the uh, Hadith, then he would try to find something from which he can take an analogy something which is similar and base basically his legal advice on that. In many countries, the same here in, in Germany, Muslims have a book and that book was prepared by the late Dr. Yusuf Al-Karadavi, an Egyptian Sunni theologian who lived in Qatar but died, uh, I think last year, and he has written a book uh, and a collection of what is allowed for a Muslim and what is forbidden. And you realize from that how big uh, Sharia law plays a role in every person or every Muslim's life. Um, I mean, it is not just ordering your religious life, but tells you with what foot you have to go into the toilet or leave the toilet, and whether that is the left hand or the right hand, what you have to do with the left hand, what you have to do with the right hand. So it's quite strict legalistic thinking, which is based on what Muhammad said and did in the past. And it is ordering not just the individual Muslim's life, but also the, the country's. Uh, which are dominated by Islam. Um, okay, I've... Um, to make it more complicated with the Sharia law, um, you realize it is not a written down code of, or codex of laws, but it's rather a method, a methodology, how you reach or achieve a legal advice on an issue. Uh, and therefore, of course, 
uh, not all legal experts in Islam would arrive at the same advice. They come to different conclusions. And to make it more complicated, there are different schools of legal thought in Islam. Um, the four major school is the Hanafiya, then the, uh, that is in Turkey and Central Asia, the Malikiya in North and West Africa, the Shafi'iya in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and also in East Africa, the people follow basically the Shafi'iya. And uh, then there is the Hanbaliya in, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, then the, uh, Sun the Shia have their own uh, legal schools. So you realize that the whole issue of, of laws, of legal advice and how you do things, it is very, very important. It's actually more important often than let's say theology or the beliefs. It is much more what you do and how you do it. Uh, I mentioned that the Sharia law is based on the Quran, these 114 um, surahs, but also on the Sunnah or these Hadith collections. And um, these Hadith uh, sayings and deeds of Muhammad were being used for the last, for the first 200 years in Islam after the death of, uh, of Muhammad. And only in the ninth century, so about 200 years later, they were collected uh, by different people. And there are different collections of these uh, sunnas, of these uh, hadith and the deeds of, of Muhammad. And the most important one is by uh, someone from Central Asia, Al-Bukhari. And just to give you an impression what he did, he traveled in the ninth century through all of the Muslim countries and collected these sayings or what people claimed Muhammad had said or what he did. And he collected about 700,000 of these sayings and um, what people claimed he did. And if you look into these collections of um, uh, hadith, it would start that so-and-so has said, now that Muhammad did this or said this, and this was uh, um, put to the next person, to the next person, to the next person, and then eventually it came to Al-Bukhari. So there is a chain of uh, passing on something to, uh, to, um, to Bukhari. So I had about 700,000 of these, so he screened and, and studied and checked it all. And he said, most of it is faked. And he said, Muslim rulers in the past, in these 200 years between Muhammad died and Bukhari collected these issues, Muhammad, uh, Muslim rulers in order to support what they decided, said, oh, Muhammad said so and so, and therefore I do it this way. So it was not really from Muhammad, but uh, someone else made it up and said it was Muhammad who said or did this. So of these 700,000, which Bukhari himself collected, eventually said there are about 7,400. So a little more than 1% of what he collected, he said they are authentic or they are really from uh, uh, Muhammad. But even among these uh, hadith, 
sayings of Muhammad and what he did. Even there he categorized and said, no, not everything is authentic, not everything is good. So he made uh, several, four different categories, whether a hadith is authentic, whether it's beautiful, whether it's weak, or whether um, it is simply nice to read it. So you realize how, how shaky the foundation of these hadith collections are. And of course, they play a big role in um, every Muslim's life, even until today. So that is about the, the Sunnah, the tradition, the Hadith collections. And as I mentioned, the Hadith collection of uh, Muhammad, uh, of uh, Bukhari is, is the, the best one. There are other collections by a man called Muslim, Al-Tirmithi, Abu Daud, Al-Nasai, and Al-Kaswini and also Malik ibn Anas and Ahmad ibn Banwal. So there are about eight, nine different collections, but the most important one is that of Al-Bukhari. A word about uh, political Islam or Islamism. Um, Islamic activists who pursue a political Islam, meaning uh, those Muslims who pursue to introduce Islam more and more in a country and want to, to have a bigger room for Islamic law and would eventually, if they could, take over the government so that they can order the country according to uh, Muslim or Islamic laws. Uh, so there are those, uh, and that's important to understand, there are those Muslims for whom Islam is simply a personal religion, like I'm a Christian. And there are those Muslims who think politically and who try to find more and more room to introduce Islamic rule and Islamic law, and uh, who are basically politicians for whom Islam is, is an ideology too, and they want to have power. They are after power in the country. And you have to divide between uh, someone who is simply, who has a particular Islamic belief and someone who actually has a political agenda. Uh, and we'll talk about that issue in the third paper but it's important to understand. Uh, a word to Sufism. In the Islamic history, early on, you always had people, of course, who longed for having a personal relationship with God and for whom Islam was just that to pursue a relationship with God, who were mystics, who uh, were not interested in politics, who were not uh, interested primarily in the rituals, but in the spiritual, in the internal, in the relationship with uh, the, the, the other world. And we call that Islamic mysticism or Sufism. And um, it plays a role in, in the world. And in some countries, Sufism is stronger than in other countries. Um, in Turkey, you have a, a strong Sufi relationship. You have Sufi orders also in the Arab world. In, we had it in Indonesia. And uh, I'm sure that there will be Sufis in, in Kenya as well. And you might find Sufis among Sunni Muslims, among Shia Muslims. So uh, Sufism is a, a kind of understanding um, Islam more from the 
from the uh, mystical side. And often you might have seen or uh, experienced that in Kenya, that Sufis either in small communities, in houses, or in Indonesia, where it's sometimes in, in soccer stadiums, that thousands of Muslims would uh, gather for a night and they would do something which is called a dhikr. They would repeat names of Allah in a rhythmical, rhythmical way and slowly get into trance and have a particular experience of uh, spiritual experience in that way. Um, so Sufis would, would uh, as I mentioned, not be interested in politics. They would rather see it as their way of connecting with, with God. If you look at the different um, uh, Muslim uh, versions or Muslim uh, societies, Muslim communities in Africa, you will realize a great variety in, in Africa. It depends whether Islam came early on, like in Egypt and North Africa, whether you had early on uh, Islamic empires, like in West Africa, or whether um, Islam came rather late in some countries, maybe only in the 19th uh, century or even in the 20th centuries, and where um, Muslims are a small minority. Um, and therefore that plays a role, of course, in, in a particular country. And um, that uh, makes it the differences for Islam in, in uh, Africa. If we come to Kenya, uh, Islam is a minority. You have about 11% uh, of the population, about 5.5 million. And if you look into Kenya, of course, uh, Muslims are not evenly spread because, because they arrived they arrive. first from um, Oman from the Arabian Peninsula at the coastal areas, uh, you see Muslims particularly strong in the coastal areas of Kenya and Tanzania, Zanzibar, um, and uh, more often they are Kiswahili speaking uh, or Arabic speaking. Um, then of course, in the north of Kenya, you have also uh, long-standing Muslim communities. But generally, uh, Islam is not uh, evenly spread in, in Kenya. The majority of um, Muslims in Kenya are Sunni Muslims. About 81% of the Muslims are Sunni Muslims. And what is binding them together is uh, the five pillars. Shahada, the Islamic creed, Salat, the ritual prayer, um, five times a day, Zakat, the charity, Psalm, the fasting during Ramadan, and the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca once in a lifetime. If you meet a Sunni Muslim, you have to be aware not all Sunni Muslims are, of course, the same. As I mentioned, you will probably find very secular Sunni Muslims in Nairobi, well-educated, and um, you will find very pious, traditional uh, Muslims in, in villages. Um, in Germany, you would find atheistic uh, Muslims who don't go to the mosque any longer, who don't care about Islam, but because you can't leave Islam officially, so they just stop practicing Islam. Um, then you have in Kenya, 
as we had in Indonesia, many Muslims who mix up their Islamic beliefs with um, superstition, with magic, with uh, the demonic, with the occult. Um, so there are quite variety of issues and you often have uh, a kind of a mixture of belief uh, among Muslims. Um, and that makes it important to come back to evangelism when you talk to a Muslim, not to assume that you know what he believes. You would have to, to really ask him to share and try to understand what he really believes about, about God, about angels, about the demonic, about the last days, uh, about uh, the, more, uh, the Quran. You also would have to, uh, to understand many Muslims don't read the Quran. They don't know the, uh, the Quran. They, they know certain issues. You also have to understand the, the prayers in the mosque five times a day. Even if a person doesn't speak Arabic, but the prayer has to be done in Arabic. So often they would learn it by heart, say it in Arabic and hardly know what he's praying. You find in all countries, and I'm sure you will find that in Kenya, young boys learning for two years the Arabic Quran, these 114 surahs by heart in Arabic, not really understanding what they know and what they, what they learn by heart, but they know it by heart. So uh, that has to do with the importance that Islam gives to the Arabic language. And therefore, if for example, you have a Quran that is in English language, they would not say it's a proper translation. You cannot really translate the Quran. It is similar to, uh, to the Arabic, but it's not a real Quran. So that is the importance of uh, the Arabic language. A few words about Shia, about 7% of uh, the uh, Muslims in Kenya identify as Shia, and there are different Shia groups. Generally, we talk about 12 Shia, that's it, Iran, 7 Shia, that's particularly in India and Pakistan, and also in, in Kenya, and a 5 Shia, which is particular in Yemen. It has to do with the belief in the Shia religion that uh, the spiritual authority from Muhammad did not go to the caliphs like in, in uh, Sunni Islam, but they went to family members of Muhammad, to imams. And there were up to 12 Imams, a sequence of 12 Imams in the early 200, uh, 200 years. And the last Imam went into hiding, into secrecy. And in Iran, that's the 12th Imam. In, uh, um, in India and Pakistan, it's the uh, seventh Imam, and in Yemen, it's the fifth Imam. And these Imams in hiding, they return at the end of the days and the last day as Mahdi and play a role in Shia Islam, Shia eschatology. So that is one of the important issues of Shia. In Sunni Islam, the Sunni Muslims elected the best suited person to become the follower of Muhammad in rulership, in spiritual leadership. But in uh, Shia Islam, it must be someone from the family um, uh, of Muhammad 
and what that was first his cousin and son-in-law Ali and then the two sons of Ali, Hassan and Hussein. And both Hassan, Ali and Hassan and Hussein were murdered by Sunnis and that explains a great hatred between Shia and, um, Mus and Sunni Muslims. And that plays a big role between Saudi Arabia, which is Sunni, Sunni and Iran, which is Shia. And that uh, hatred is so big that um, they even could go to war. The main differences between Sunni and um, Shia Muslim Muslims, one is who is in leadership, and then the return of the Mahdi at the end times, that is particularly in, um, in um, Shia Islam. Um, then the Shia Muslims would not accept the Shia, the Sunni schools of legal thoughts. They have their own legal uh, school of legal thought. They would not accept the first caliphs, Ibn Bakr and Umar and Usman. They would start only with Ali as the fourth caliph. Um, the, the Shia Muslims would go to Shia mosques and would not normally enter any, any Sunni mosque because of that hatred, uh, hatred. In Shia Islam, the suffering of particularly Hussein plays a big role. They have every year in connection with Ashura. Um, you could call that passion place. There are big processions through Shia cities in Iran and in other countries where the Shia dominate. Um, and these uh, Shia Muslims who walk in that um, um, procession are wailing. Often they are cutting themselves with knives and swords so that, that uh, blood is, is flowing. It's a reenactment of the last battle of Muhammad in 680 at the town of Karbala in what is today Iraq. And they reenact that. And that reenaction of that passion of Hussein plays a role in uh, Shia theology, in redemption, what they believe is uh, redemption. To explain that from a Sunni writer, uh, there was a, a few years ago, I think in 2016, an article in Cairo written by, by a Sunni author. And he said the following, it's quite interesting to understand that. Shia has been based on two foundations suffering from victimhood and asking for justice. With the passing of time, that has to do with the, with the murder of um, Hussein and Hassan and Ali. With the passing of time, these basic principles became deeply embedded in the life of Shiites. Wherever Shiites live, has become Karbala. That's a place where the last battle took place. And all time is now Ashura. That is the celebration of that last battle. The main purpose of the believer has been, of the Shia believer has become an act of bemoaning and wailing the historic event and transforming it into contemporary event and so that this event becomes actual, actualized. And so uh, Shia Muslims feel again as victims of Sunnis and uh, they call for justice, justice. They want vengeance, they want justice. And so that plays a big role in the relationship 
between Su Sunni and, uh, and Shia Muslims. Then you have uh, Ibadi Muslims in um, Kenya. They are adherents of Ibadism. The Ibadis today uh, are basically Muslims in Oman. And their Islam is considered a moderate type of um, Islam. Um, they, it's quite humane. It's innate knowledge through the use of reason rather than being just learned. Um, and they believe wherever the Quran contradicts reason, then they would have to interpret the Quran spiritually and figuratively. Um, for them, the attributes of God, you might be aware that many Muslims have a kind of a rosary with 33 pearls, which they, they hold in their right hand and they, they, they use every pearl uh, in connection with one of the 99 names of Allah. And for the Ibadis, these attributes, these names are not separate. Uh, so it's, it's again a theological issue among the Muslims, the different types of Muslims, how to look at the names, whether that is something in its own right or whether it is simply part of, of um, uh, Allah. So um, Ibadis look at it as simply a part of, of, of Allah. For quite a number of the Ibadis, the Quran was created. And when we talk about the hands of God um, or the throne of God, then for them, that's simply a, a figure. It's a symbol. Um, they also don't believe that they will see God at the day of resurrection. Um, that's also quite a number of the Shias don't believe that they eventually will see God, whereas the Sunnis are quite certain that they will see God when they, in the last day, resurrect. Uh, for Ibadis, <clears throat> everything is caused by God um, in the following way. Um, if we have a fire, that means God has caused the fire. And the fire will smoke. They will say, yes, God caused the smoke. It's, so it's not the fire that smokes. It is God that causes the fire to smoke. So there is a very strict reasoning behind it that everything is destined and determined from directly from God. And that, of course, applies also to, um, to, to, to everyday life. Oh, I have to look how much time I still have. Oh, I have, have still a few minutes. Uh, just uh, the last, uh, could you give the, the last uh, slide, uh, Jeff? Jeff? Yeah, okay. Uh, one or two words about Quranism and the Ahmadiyya. Quranism are Muslims, and you are reminded of, of Christians uh, uh, here. Uh, who only believe in the Quran, the tradition, the Hadith, the Hadith collections, all that has no sense for Quran only Muslims. So, and because so much is not written in the Quran, 
they don't believe in it. So for example, uh, Muhammad in the tradition has said, someone who leaves uh, Islam has to be killed. The Quran doesn't say that. In the Quran, someone who betrays Islam and leaves Islam will be punished in heaven. So the Quran only Muslims would say, we only believe what the Quran actually says and nothing what Muhammad later on might have said. So um, that of course uh, uh, will have consequences in their daily life. They don't believe in an Iman Mahdi because that's not mentioned in the Quran. Um, even circumcision is for them not relevant because the circumcision is not mentioned in the Quran. Last word about the Ahmadiyya. There are uh, quite a number of Ahmadiyya Muslims in Kenya, and it's a controversial Islamic sect. Mainline Islam would not accept the Ahmadiyya as true Muslims. It's a syncretistic belief. It goes back to a man called Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who in the 19th century, in 1889, um, claimed that he himself was a prophet and he introduced certain things in uh, the Inman uh, Muslim belief. And uh, because normally Muslims, both Sunni as or Shia Muslims uh, would believe, no, Muhammad was the last uh, prophet. So there cannot be another uh, uh, prophet. And therefore they would not recognize the Ahmadiyya, the Ahmadi uh, religion as a Muslim sect. They say it's non Muslim. The International Center of uh, the Ahmadiyya is in Pakistan, although there in Pakistan the Ahmadiyya is actually forbidden. Um, they are not allowed to practice it and they are not allowed to preach it there. So often the leader of the Ahmadiyya lives in England. What is important with regard to evangelism is that uh, we understand there's a lot of variety in Islam. We cannot assume when we meet a Muslim that we know what he believes. We have to talk to see him as an individual. We have to ask questions. We have to let him explain. And as we enter a good dialogue, we learn more about how he sees Islam, how he lives it, how Islam affects his life and where we can share our own belief and how we can pray for him. As I mentioned with regard to political Islam that I will talk about in the third paper. Okay, I think my time is up. Uh, this is Kutz, or how do you pronounce his name? Uh, the German family name. name is Cool, like the English word C double O L, cool. Oh, this day preach. And they Dieter, preach cool, my, yeah. my first name Dieter is like Peter, only okay. with a D at the beginning. So it's very thank easy. You. Okay, thank you very much, cool. And uh, <laughs> it has been a lovely uh, lecture to hear you differentiate between the Sunni, the Shia the points of controversy to the issues of how the Quran came to be, the ways in which uh, spirituality is practiced. And uh, it has been very enriching to really receive uh, such wisdom. My prayer is that uh, these you leaders and my team to investigate how is the character and the spirituality of the Muslim neighbor because one may be either Shia and Sunni, and the controversy is involved in terms of who they are. And yet at the same time, having an ability to understand them, 
see how we can be able to reach them. So it has been very enriching uh, piece of information that you've given unto us. And I pray that uh, more of our clergy will desire to delve deeper so that we can be able to learn. I normally feel challenged because they say, they call us, we call them Muslim brothers, but yet at the same time, they call us kafir. And maybe perhaps you can be able to distinguish between that, how we call them brothers and sisters, yet for them, we are kafir. And what is the implication of that? Because, yeah. and maybe perhaps the second question would be, what is the place of the interreligious forums? Because for me, they appear as if they are catch 22 for us not to evangelize them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop. We have lost your mic. Aldita. Um, I think the first question with regard to the spirituality, um, it depends on the person. You will find very decent, pious Muslims for whom Islam is simply their personal faith and they try hard to live a decent life. And they are quite, normally uh, Muslims are very open to share their faith. Um, quite frankly, it is much easier to talk, it was much easier to talk to a Muslim in Indonesia uh, than to talk to a secular German here in, in Germany. Um, as soon as you start, you start talking to a secular German, he might tell you, uh, please leave me alone, I don't want to hear that. Oh. Uh, a Muslim would never say that, but mm. he would be rather interested in asking questions. Mm. The other issue, um, um, sorry, I, 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 I'm lost with the second question. Jeff, can, can you, could you <laughs> repeat that? The oh. second question, the quest, the second question was on oh, the, the forum. Interreligious, interreligious yeah. dialogue. Yeah. And the part 22 for us so that we may not evangelize them. Yeah. No yeah. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we have similar forums here in Germany. There are even people who think because Abraham or Ibrahim is mentioned in Judaism, in Christianity and Islam, that there could be something like an Abrahamic ecumenical forum. The issue is, if you look into that uh, issue of Abraham theologically, then of course you realize that the story of Abraham in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible and in Islam is very, very different. For Muslims, and actually I will come in the second paper to that, uh, Abraham is not a Jew, not a Christian, of course. He's a believer and he's considered the first Muslim. And together with his son Ishmael, he built the Kaaba in Mecca, which is, of course, not our belief. Um, in all the dialogue processes I have seen here in, in Germany, um, I think what it can do is to get to know each other better. I have been in a, in a forum here in my home city with Turkish background Sufi believers. They were Sunni and they shared their faith 
and I was able to share my faith. And there was an understanding how each one does it, but we leave it at that. Um, I don't believe that dialogue would lead to um, anything theologically. It is a matter, a good process of understanding each other. In the political or let's say the community area, it can lead to, to uh, maybe cooperate on certain levels that is possible. But one of the danger or one of the issues is that it's true here in Germany as well, Muslims don't like missions. They actually want to force the churches to forfeit missions among Muslims. And some of the Protestant uh, churches here in Germany have gone as far, they don't allow missionary work among Jews and they don't want missionary work among Muslims. They rather want harmony and they want peace and they feel that missionary work is is hindering that and for that reason they one of the protestant churches here in my area one of the denominations has come out with a paper where they actually uh, dismiss or forbid missionary work among muslims so that is what muslims want they don't want that uh, christians evangelize and uh, they offer dialogue, yes. They offer cooperation, but only with the condition that we stop evangelizing. And that of course is not in line with our, what our Lord has said. Thank, thank you for your comment. Okay, so um, there's another questions uh, written in our chat box. So I'll just read it out to you. So Muslims highly disagree with a try on nature of God, that is what they believe. Yeah. They claim the word of God revealed in the Old and New Testament is corrupted. How should one help this Muslim to come to salvation yet? But Jesus didn't believe is the only way to salvation is the question um, i will come to that actually in the second paper when we talk about evangelism um, uh, of muslims uh, where will explain some of the basics first before I go into that question. Um, when I talk to uh, a Muslim, I'm of course aware they don't agree with the Trinity. They don't agree with the divinity of Christ. So when I talk to someone, I would not start with that issue but um, we we'll try to understand the person um, as a medical doctor working in indonesia i i also when i had a pa muslim patient i always at the end say may I, I may i pray with you in the name of jesus and i haven't found a muslim who said no so uh, offering prayer is one way to get into a closer relationship in a trusting. Most people like, most Muslims like that. And um, I would enter uh, talks with uh, Muslims slowly and starting where the Muslim is himself. I would often start with a story story from the Old Testament, because that is much more uh, common knowledge also among Muslims. But I will come to that in the next paper. 
Thank you. Um, there's another questions um, in the chat box. So uh, I think interfaith conferences and ventures are more for polit political stability in countries. Please comment on that. Um, yes, that's true. I mean, we have here in Germany, um, from the government, they introduced uh, conferences where the government met with different types of Muslims in order to discuss um, issues that relate to the government. And we have the same from some of the churches that they talk with Muslims. And uh, you will find those Muslims for whom Islam is simply a personal faith religion you can easily talk together you can understand each other you can share common concern the muslims here in, in germany they have concern with western culture with the western morals uh, i mean it's loose living it is a lot of things that the muslims don't like and so, and it's the same with um, Christians, uh, I mean, believing Christians, committed Christians here in Germany, who don't like it either, the way people live in Germany. So on that, on certain levels, there are similarities where you can talk to, to uh, Muslims, and uh, you might even find uh, ways where you can cooperate. When it comes to political Islam, that means people who drive a particular agenda to create power for Islam in a country, then there are different issues and we'll talk about that in the third paper. Okay, um, there's another question. Um, so who inherited Muhammad after his death? Oh, yeah. That's where Islam split. Um, the son-in-law and cousin of um, Muhammad was out at the time when Muhammad died. He was um, busy with things in connection with the the death of Muhammad. Muhammad himself had never um, publicly said who would be his successor. He died quite suddenly in 632. And during that time, a certain number of uh, Muslim leaders, for example, Abu Bakr, who was a father-in-law of, of Muhammad and some others, they decided that they would elect someone as a leader, as a follower, successor to Muhammad, and he would be called a caliph. And that first caliph was Abu Bakr. The next one was Umar. And the third one was Uthman. But Ali claimed that Muhammad had told him he would be the leader. And so the Shia believe only a family member, a, a descendant of Muhammad, could be the leader of the Muslims. So Ali thought that he himself would become the leader. And so you have from the very beginning those who wanted to elect a leader and those who said, no, it's a descendant of Muhammad. And that um, led that the second and the third and even the fourth caliph were murdered. And eventually, uh, Muawiya, one of the Sunni leaders, in 661, that he created a, 
Islamic dynasty of the Umayyads in Damascus. And then that dynasty leader, Muawiyah, and Hussein, the son of the fourth caliph, Ali, son-in-law of Muhammad, they met in battle and Hussein was killed at Karbala in 680. And after that, the Shia has, has always been a minority among Muslims. Only about 15% of world Muslims are Shia and 85% are, are Sunni. So the Sunnis always had the power and the Shias always felt they were the victims and they hated the Sunnis and looking for vengeance. So that's a problem. Okay, so um, because of time limit, so I'm going to just read out uh, another questions, but there are actually two comments actually made by Bishop Julius and maybe Pastor Joyce uh, in, in your chat box. So you can just check it out by yourself. So Dennis also um, raised the question. So um, what is the significance of Mecca in Muslim faith? Um, the normal Muslim condition, partic uh, uh, conviction, particularly the Sunni Muslims, Mecca was already prior to Islam uh, a center for pilgrimage and the Kaaba was already there, as I mentioned, built by uh, Abraham and his son Ishmael. The Arabs prior to Islam were polytheists. They believed in many gods. And there were about 360 gods in the Kaaba. And Muhammad was... Uh, born in, in the 6th century, started in 610 in Mecca, his role as a spiritual or religious leader. He had the experience that he uh, received uh, uh, spiritual messages when he was meditating and so slowly the Quran started. And uh, Islam uh, have that pilgrimage to Mecca and Mecca is considered the spiritual center so that every year today, over 2 million people come to Mecca on pilgrimage. It's also a big economic issue um, they slaughter sheep uh, there, so it's also uh, uh, quite a, a, an issue if two million visitors come to a city uh, which is not so big and slaughter two, two million uh, sheep or, or something like that. And uh, Mecca is forbidden for non-Muslims. Non-Muslims can't visit there. And... Uh, Every Muslim is required once in a while, once in a lifetime to visit, and you can go on a real pilgrimage to Mecca, but there are also smaller pilgrimages to Medina and other places in um, in um, uh, Saudi Arabia. If you look into a mosque, every mosque at one particular side of the mosque has a kibla, a, a sign, a little niche, which points to Mecca. And people would, when they pray, they know where Mecca is, they would prostrate uh, in direction to Mecca. So even if you see Muslims pray in the street or in an in a airport or even in the plane, they look on their watches, they have a, uh, an instrument so they know where Mecca is 
and they would always pray in that direction. So Mecca plays a big role uh, in the in the uh, religion of Islam. Even Shia Muslims uh, come to Mecca, besides having their own holy places in Karbala and in other places. 